everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Heidi from My Reading Life. Welcome to my car <laughs> because it is a gray, crappy day out and I have been out getting my hair cut and running errands and I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna pull over at a nice spot and even though it looks gross outside, nobody's gonna care because they're just gonna be looking at my head and books. So this is my top, um, no, let, let's just rephrase that. These are my favorite fiction reads from 2020. All the normal caveats apply. Um, these are my favorite. These are books that I read in 2020, not necessarily books that were published in 2020. No particular order. Um, actually, fiction was not uh, the best for me in 2020. I read some good fiction, but the best um, nonfiction was definitely a clearer win for me in 2020. Um, I don't know why. There's probably multiple reasons, but this isn't about the nonfiction. This is about the fiction. So I'm just going to go through uh, through these ones that um, were really great for me this year. So the first one is a book called Malagash by Joey Camo. This is a piece of Canadian fiction that I was turned on to by Sean the Book Maniac. It was a beautiful story about a family um, who's the father of the family is suffering from terminal cancer. They move back to his hometown so he can be near his, his family. Um, there are two children and a mom and the dad and the story is told from the teenage daughter's perspective. Her name is Sunday and she has decided that she is going to write a um, computer program that will infect computers worldwide that will be basically recordings of her dad's voice. Um, and that way her dad will always be in the world even after he passes away. And her voice was so strong in this novel. It was just a delight, even though it was so sad and so poignant, um, it really, really touched me and it was a really a delightful read. The, n the next book, and these are in no order, these are how they are stacked in my book bag. <laughs> Uh, is My Year of Meats by Ruth Ozeki. This is a book I buddy read with Joe Smith. Uh, we have really been loving Ruth Ozeki. And um, this book in particular, I really enjoyed. This is about a young woman who is producing um, some documentary type programming for a Japanese television network. Uh, all about, supposedly, she's supposed to be you know, promoting meat to the Japanese audience. So she's traveling around the United States, meeting with various different people and discussing, you know, whether it be ranchers or other people that are doing things, but they're supposed to be all American families, right? And she's having a hard time sticking to the script. And in the meantime, in the course of all of her research, she runs into, you know, issues about fertility, issues about um, the types of growth hormones and other things that we add to uh, the diets of the livestock that we grow for eating. So there's environmental issues in here. There's issues of, of fertility and sexism and um, how different cultures deal with uh, those issues. So good. The voice uh, of the, our main narrator, there are two ladies basically that the story is following is the, the documentarian woman and then the wife of the um, like the head of the network agency in Japan who is struggling to uh, with fertility issues. Um, so you're seeing a Japanese uh, wife's perspective and then this woman who's in America developing these documentary programs. Excellent, excellent book. Love the, I love Ruth Ozeki's voice and I love the way she weaves in um, important, um, true inf factual information into her novels. The next book I want to shout out is The Heart's Invisible Furies by John Boyne. I mean, this has been all over booktube. Um, in 2019, I loved uh, John Boyne's book that won the booktube prize. Uh, I can't remember the name of that one, but I, I love that book. So I wanted to read another book by him. Um, and this one is about Cyril Avery, who is growing up in um, Ireland and he is um, discovering his own sexuality. And so it's his, his whole life story from his perspective, growing up gay in um, Ireland during, um, I believe he's born like mid-century. And so 
at the end of the story, it's current day. Um, so you're seeing historical events through his eyes and also his, his basically his journey. Um, and it's so funny and so poignant and so touching. I really enjoyed this. John Boyne can just really pull you through a novel. He's so, uh, he writes such compulsively readable uh, fiction. I really enjoyed this book. Um, another book that I came to via the BookTube Prize was The Beekeeper of Aleppo by Christy Alferi, uh, sorry, Christy Lefteri. Um, and that was a book that I just loved as well. It has beautiful, first of all, let me just give you a brief synopsis of what it's about. So it's following this couple who is fleeing Syria um, and the violence and the war in Syria and trying to uh, escape to the UK. So they're refugees. And so we're following them through their overland journey. Then they have to make a very um, dangerous boat crossing across the Mediterranean. Um, and then their travels across Europe, all the while trying to reach other family who are already in the UK. Uh, the, the narrative is quite dreamlike. Um, you're hearing mostly from the husband's perspective and you know, you're kind of wondering um, if what he's relating to is really what's happening or not. Um, this beautiful nature writing, the scenery and stuff that he describes from him flashing back to his life as a, he was a beekeeper in, um, in Aleppo in Syria. He raised bees with his brother, I believe. Um, just beautiful, beautiful. Um, like I said, very dreamlike qualities, not normally my type of fiction, but I was just so sucked into the, this couple's story and the, the horrible trauma that they go through and they're, you know, trying to deal with that. Great story. Another book I read for the book two prize was Lanny by Max Porter. This was a book that probably surprised me the most out of all the books that I read this year. Um, I did not expect to like this book. I have never found the descriptions of Max Porter's books to be anything that I was particularly interested in. So this is a story of um, a family in England in a small village. The boy who uh, we're getting um, some of his perspective is He's a little bit different. He's a little bit sort of um, beyond his years and his understanding of the world. Uh, he seems to have a connection with nature that maybe isn't quite what you would expect a young child to have. His parents are trying to figure out how to deal with him. Um, and they basically hook him up with an artist in their community to try to give him another outlet. Um, and he seems to be quite interested in art and the artist and the young boy form a very, um, close relationship and they really like each other and really connect and so we're getting their their story as well and then in the meantime you're getting some pieces of the story narrated from this dead papa tooth war who is um like a myth a legend um, a supernatural being the myths and lore of the greenwood basically of nature um, and those pieces of the narrative are sort of in the physical copy of the book are written in this very like words all over the page, um, not in a straightforward narrative. And I just was enraptured with this book. It's a short novel. Um, I sat down and read it all in one go. I just like gulped it down. I just really connected with the story. Um, I loved the uh, elements of how humans are becoming disconnected from nature and if that's a good or a bad thing. Um, I thought it was really, uh, it really captivated me. Okay, what else do I have in my bag of tricks over here? I have um, another book two prize book. This is Girl, Woman, Other, which won the book two prize in 2020 for fiction. This is by Bernadine Evaristo. This has been all over everywhere on everybody's top list of 2020, no surprise. Um, this was an absolute delight to read. This is basically almost like interconnecting short stories. Each chapter is from a different woman's perspective. And I think all but one are black British women. Um, and so we really are getting uh, a overview of what life is like for black women in the UK um, through time because there's different generations here. We have, you know, young women, elderly women, mothers, daughters, friends. There's a, also a, um, a clear through line of how art and being in the artist community and the theater community um, impacts your uh how you connect with people and and how how the world views you i guess um this deals with issues of feminism of sexism of you know lgbtq issues 
just everything, family issues. Um, and it was just a delight to read. It was a delight to discover how these women connected with each other, if they connected with each other or not. Um, there are some harrowing stories told in here about domestic violence, so be warned for that. Um, but I, I really thought this was incredible. I was worried about it because I had heard um, the format of this story, the way it's told is not, you know, there's not capitalization and punctuation the way that a normal story would flow. And I, I felt like that might impede my progress through the book, but I didn't find um, that to be a problem at all. Once I started reading this book, it flows really well. And I never noticed, um, once I get into the book, I never noticed the oddities with um, the grammar, not the grammar so much, but the, the punctuation and capitalization and that sort of thing. Um, let's see, what else do we have in here? Oh, no surprise, um, probably to anyone, one of my favorite books of the year <laughs> was the Stephen King book um, that I read the last bit of, of in the fall. This is The Institute by Stephen King. Um, this, uh, I actually ended up listening to this on audiobook and it was fantastic on audiobook. I would highly recommend you consume it that way if you are a person that likes Stephen King. I did not find this one to be particularly gross. If that is something you're worried about with Stephen King, it wasn't particularly like the, the it wasn't super scary I mean there are some tense bits in here for sure but this is the story of a young boy uh, named Luke Ellis who is kidnapped from his home in the middle of the night and taken to this place called the Institute where some kind of shadowy agency is performing experiments on young people who have um, extrasensory abilities whether that be um, sort of like PSP or telekinesis things like that um and so he has to like figure out first of all where the heck he is and why he's there and then it's the story of his friendships that he forms with the other kids that are in this institute and then you know how they um interact with the folks that are running the institute um and i don't want to spoil anything so i don't want to go into it any more than that but there is a uh, parallel storyline um about a man named, uh, what is the other guy's name? I can't remember now, but there's a cop in here anyway that gets connected into the story. Um, and his, at first you, you kind of open the book with his story and you're like, what is this dude in the story? But never fear, he, he comes into play. He's an important part of the story. Um, so I, the thing about Stephen King that I love is how he writes his characters. He's particularly good with writing kids, I think. Um, the relationship between Luke and the other kids at the Institute was just really touching and funny and poignant. Um, and it, this book says a lot too about how government is always kind of working in the shadows and what they might be up to <laughs> with those projects, which is a little, that is a little bit scary, actually. Oh, that's a lot scary. Um, but I really enjoyed this book. It was a heck of a good ride. Um, and I definitely recommend that one. Um, and then the, one of the books I read, uh, towards the end of, uh, the year, right, uh, I actually read it right after Christmas. This is Kim Jong, Jim, Kim Ji Young, born 1982 by Cho Nam Ju, and this was translated from the Korean by Jamie Chang. Um, and so this book, short novel again, uh, all about this woman who is, we basically learn the story of her life. She, um, and when the story first opens, she is married. She is, uh, she has given up her career to stay at home and take care of the children. Um, and she's not, it's not going well. She's not doing well. She's having some issues mentally. Um, and you're sort of having flat. And then after that, you sort of get the, the beginning part of her story, the early part of her childhood, growing up in her family and how she and her sister were treated differently than her brother, how she was treated through her educational years, um, what the culture in Korea is like in terms of, um, how they, uh, how women are, um, not supported and who are treated like second-class citizens a lot of the time, how women are treated in the workforce. Um, this is, uh, well, it's been described all over as like basically the Korean book for the Me Too movement. And I would definitely second that. If you are at all interested in, in sort of feminist issues, issues around um, how women are held back from achieving everything that they could achieve, by society and by culture, I would highly recommend this. This is excellent. And the ending of this book 
is awesome. The way this wraps up and ties everything together, so good. I love this book. And then I want to give one shout out to the best sort of overall experience for um, my bookish life this year. And that was my reread of the Bridgerton series of romance novels and then watching the Netflix um, ad ad adaptation of the Bridgerton series over the Christmas holidays with my romance reading buddies, Katie and Doris. Um, I had read the entire Bridgerton series at least well, multiple times um, since they first came out. Um, I love them. I've always enjoyed Julia Quinn's writing. She is so smart and so funny. And, you know, she was doing sort of uh, feminist romance before it was a thing. I think she was one of the originators of, you know, sort of modernizing the romance novel, the Regency romance novel or the historical romance novel. Um, and I love the, the Bridgertons. They're just amazing and funny and, and, and heartwarming and so lovely and reading these books with Doris and Katie has been an absolute joy um, this fall and this winter and then watching that Netflix series which I absolutely love they are not the same as the books um, but that's okay they are their own thing and they are delightful and fun and I would highly recommend them so those are the best of the best that I read for fiction in 2020 um, I will try to get to my nonfiction best of here pretty quick. <laughs> Things are coming slowly in dribs and drabs this month in January, but what can we say? Life, life has just been weird for a long time and probably will continue to be weird. I hope you are all doing well and finding some great books to read and I will talk to you later.